<clears throat> name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean. This story is um, a, a story about how God possibly sees himself. He has uh, two children, one of whom is very rebellious, the other one who you might call passive-aggressive. A passive-aggressive person is a person who seems to go along with things. But they do things or they drag their feet in certain ways to let you know that they really aren't with the program. Again, there's not much dialogue, so we might be in shaky ground if we draw too many inferences. But one thing that I would like to ask is, why, God, did you not, when telling this story, did you not have the Father explain to each of his sons what it was he was about, what his philosophy of life was, so that if they were dull, or if they were just overtaken by their own lusts that they couldn't see or wouldn't see, that he would at least have it on record. This is why I'm living the way that I'm living. This is why I've made the choices that I've made. This is why I think in the long run they will be most profitable. Then if we saw rebellion in the context of that, we would know exactly what was in the young man's mind we would also know what was in the mind of the elder brother. Far too many parents, I think, as, as I have gone to homes to try to help, uh, little help that I have been, but in my efforts, I have found that one of the most clear, unkept responsibilities by most parents are to explain to their children in a holistic way why they've done the things they've done in their life. They're ashamed of their failures. They don't want to talk about their aspirations because they secretly think that by doing so, the evil eye will be brought upon them and therefore they'll fail even before they've made a decent attempt at success. They haven't gone step by step to say, this is the reason that we do these things. Now, if you wish to be a reasonable person, then I ask you to reason with me. Why is your way better? Or why is it that the thing that you want preferable than the thing that I want for you? But it doesn't come down to that. Because you see, the children also have in this dynamic their own failure. And that is, they aren't honest with the parents. Um, one of the most um, feckless, if I can use that word, attempts to hide anything is to put it under your mattress. <laughs> when you're young, you think that who would ever look under my mattress? Who would ever do that? Now, I don't remember. I don't remember doing that, but I'm certain I must have. But I'll tell you that both of my children have. And both of my children have had a passion and a lust for chocolate. And one time, in the course of just taking the dirty sheets from my son's bed, I thought to flop his mattress, you know, rotate it as you do certain times uh, per year. And as I lifted it up, I found several gigantic candy bars. The candy bars that are about one foot by four inches. <clears throat> he was about seven. First I wondered, how could he have stolen those? Because I didn't give him any money to buy them. But then I found out that he had, in league with him, a subversive agent 
that being his Theta. Theta, Theta liked him to be happy, and Theta gave him money, and he went with Theta shopping sometimes. And when he came back, he had candy bars. <clears throat> he had four or five candy bars, and he had some cash. And I was just amazed. My daughter has done similar things, although not quite, um, not quite to that extent. And, and I will say now, as I had talked to you earlier about commemorating certain things, every feast my son expects from me and gets one pound of C's candy, his favorite choices. Bordeaux, uh, uh, butterscotch squares, um, different truffles. And these are the ones that he, he, he particularly likes. Buttercreams. And you have to know what he, what he wants. Because he doesn't want anything with nuts in it. He doesn't want any chewy things. Unless it's a butter chew. A butter chew is okay. He doesn't want any mints. And he's expecting this. <clears throat> he's going to be 30 years old. <clears throat> but this sense of hiding things, deeper things, more important things than just chocolate, we do this all the time. We hide it from the ones that we live with, whether they are our spouses or our parents or our grandparents. We hide it from friends. We have this other side of self, and we keep this secret. And all you do when you keep these things secret is you aid the devil. This is why I talk so often and so frequently, even though my family can't stand it, about the things that they have done. I also talk about the things that I have done. And I do that because no one then can use it against me. It's old news. What is somebody going to say? When I was younger that I stole penny candy from the store next to my elementary school? Yeah, I did that. You know. That I paid a girl when I was uh, 11 years old, 50 cents, to sneak out her sister's diary who I had a, I had a crush on and I wanted to find out what she thought about me. Yeah, I did that. You know, how I used to torment the old women that lived next door to me. I would ring their doorbell and then run off the porch silently. I did that. And I did many, many more things. And nobody can say anything to me about these things because I've already said it myself. Now, it's not because I'm proud. It's not for any other reason than to say, we all do these things, but if we would stop before we make these inner actions manifest, that they remain only thoughts that twirl around in our head. We share them with someone else, and that helps dissipate their energy. You know when you have a, a steamed locomotive, when you, when you ring, or not ring, it's the wrong term, when you, when, you, when you blow the whistle on the locomotive, inside the air compressor, the, the, the big front part, um, that locomotive, it loses its energy. So when they're going up a hill, you will never hear the uh, refrain of the locomotive. It's only when they're going downhill or on the flat, and they can afford it. In the same way, the, the kind of stuff that produces steam between your ears, if you vent, right? You've all heard that term psychologically. If you vent... What does vent mean? It's taking some of the pressure away, luring it a little bit. Then it will not take and manifest itself in a physical action as likely. So you have with the prodigal son um, and with his brother, who I've characterized as being passive-aggressive, you, you have a kind of void where we would be much more fulfilled if we knew that discourse had taken place. Then we could more perfectly pinpoint the motives of each one. But if we just take this in the way in which it was meant generally, 
There are some people who have been born into the church at a very early age and church was just an obligation and they never shared, if there was any in the lives of their parents, joy. They never shared the joy. And I was talking today as, as we prayed Psalm 83. How beloved are thy dwellings, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord. My soul longs and faints to be in God's house. I'm fainting to be here. I long to be here. And it's, 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 it's a very sensitive place. It's a place where the turtle dove makes her nest. You know, it's a place where, where one of the most skittish of animals finds peace. And the heart, of, uh, the heart of man is like that, torn, moving back and forth. Sometimes it grieves me so much when somebody comes in the door of the church and everybody's head turns. It means, I mean, it's, it's written on the faces of the people that go like this. They're not with and they're not present in the activity of the church. And it's not whether or not um, this is spiritually entertaining for you. Maybe you already know what I've said. Maybe you, you don't even want to hear this. Maybe it's the most boring thing, and you've heard far better sermons. But to be present in the house of God means even to be able to sit in silence when nothing is taking place, and finding that there is an element that creates synergy, and that element is the presence of God because it is God's house. So if you come upon a church and you're all alone and the door is open and there's no one else there to sit down and to be present in His presence has great validity for the soul that is reaching for that level. So you have these two young men characterized as types of people that deal with the Father, God Almighty, in two ways. Well, I know I have to do it because I recognize that you're God, but I sure don't want to do it. And the other one, well, if you've made me this way, then you certainly have to make excuse for the things that you know I'm certainly going to do because you made me that way. There are some people that uh, say that because um, a man will have, uh, you know, an extra chromosome, that he will be one of these uber, uber men, something that produces greater testosterone, greater um, risk-taking, greater impulsiveness. Um, people who are in prison many times are checked in their DNA to, to see whether or not they have this because it, it is true, if it's harnessed properly, then it's like a, a great animal that's pulling something and they can pull a lot of weight, but if it's not harnessed and if it's improperly focused, it creates great damage and distress. But the wild child and then the one that was passive and meek but was a cauldron of, uh, of distaste for his father's life bubbling over continuously. And you notice, he says, not did you ever give me the fatted calf, did you ever give me even a goat? <laughs> a goat! You know, he was rebuking his father, a goat. Uh, there, there are many elements in this as, as we've been through this before, but I wanted to bring up these now because the practical aspect of this gospel today in my mind is a clear one. We must, we must not be afraid to speak to each other about the things that are inside us so that they may dissipate, so that they do not bring pressure over and above so we don't explode. How many people have anger issues? What is anger? 
What is anger? At the base of it, all it is, is frustration contained in an ever-confining vessel. More and more and more frustration in a tinier and tinier space. And the pressure builds, and then there's an outburst. And how many people confess because of those kinds of outbursts that they do all kinds of things. So we must speak and speak openly. There isn't anyone here, there isn't anyone here who has the right to judge you as though they themselves are perfect. So if you know that, if the priest stands at the entrance to the sanctuary bowing and begging for your forgiveness, then who else is there that is going to look at you and say to you, the sin that you now confess to me makes you repulsive and I don't any longer wish to have you in my company. That won't happen. And if everybody heard about it, because the trust issue, if I tell this person, will it leave his lips into the ears of another? And if it does? And if it does, so what? So what? What is it that you are trying to hide? God already knows, so do you fear the people more than God? I tell you we should return to the way that it was in the beginning of the church when we confessed our sins publicly. There are few people that would want to do that, but that would be the healthier thing to do, to confess sins publicly. And then everyone would know. Uh, I'll tell you uh, uh, one more story and then I'll conclude. When I was a brand new priest, I was serving maybe about my tenth liturgy after the monastery. I prayed every day, of course, and went around to all the churches. And I went to the one where my father of confession served in Egypt. And this old man came, this old man came, and he looked like a rhinoceros or a buffalo wrapped in a blanket. He had bare foot, bare feet. He was, he was um, a very crude, I mean, he was somebody that you would find, you know, waist deep in water in Tanta or a very agricultural area of Egypt. And uh, he came to the communion. I was holding the cup, and I, I, I had a vice-like grip on the cup. I was just, I didn't know what to expect. He came and took communion without event and then left. And just as it was happening, my father confession, maybe he noticed something, I, I don't know. Maybe his spirit was told something by God. But he, he said, this man, did you see him? And he described the man as I have described him to you. Yes, I was afraid. He said, this man is a saint. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he came to me and he confessed it as a sin that his wife, um, uh, he missed her. He uh, sometimes wept when he thought of her. And he was confessing that as a sin, that he missed his wife, that he wept when he thought of her. And he said, you know, the amazing thing is that he only lost her two weeks ago. And he had such um, a delicate feeling about how one should be, how one should feel when um, something that you think belongs to you returns to the Lord who made it. Uh, there, there's a Protestant uh, woman from the Netherlands. Her name is, uh, I think, Cory Ten Boom. It's an odd name. Cory Ten Boom. And she says that um, she tries not to hold anything very tightly <coughs> because she knows that one day God is going to take it from her fingers. 
Um, so you hear, you hear sometimes in confession things that are not just dirty, but things that cause you to re-examine yourself and think, what kind of Christian am I? In other words, they uplift you. There's another confession I can tell you about. Uh, a, 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 a young man confessed that one of his relatives spit at him. And he turned away his face. And he confessed it as a sin. Because the Lord did not turn his face away from spitting. You see? So when you hear some things like that, publicly, as I'm, I'm telling you now, how does it make you feel? It, isn't it, doesn't, it, doesn't it give you a sense of there are holy people that are, that are with us? Very holy people? You see? This is the, the kind of thing that, that public confession um, will reveal. Uh, I've heard many things um, that have done as much uh, to teach me, uh, to encourage me, to uplift me, as have been to shame me, or things that I, I wanted to walk away from because they were things that were disgusting to me, or things that repulsed me. If we'll share, if we'll really be a community, and if we'll really share, it won't come to this point where God will have but two sons, one who is rebellious and the other who is passive-aggressive. But rather, there will be the normal give and take and function of family where there is a meeting of the minds and a convergence or sometimes there is an active give and take or a push and a shove. But there is oneness. There is not separation. And the community is strong. Um, I'm not spoken to you about this, but uh, before, but um, today I heard something that made me think of, of of how much we need to be a family. We really need to be a family, not just to make this little tiny church succeed. But you know, there are places all over the world that used to be Christian, really Christian. I mean, it was just assumed you were Christian. And an odd person was a Jew. Now, to be a confessing religious individual, it's odd to be a Christian in, as I said, a number of those places. For example, Europe. Most people just laugh. Most people just laugh. And the churches are filled with old and few young. America, America is just Europe's little brother. It'll come here. It'll come here. And if you go to places where even there are more rebellious little brothers, like Australia, the offshoot of the British Empire, you'll find even less confessing and less practicing Christians. It'll happen to us. It's an absolute certainty. But, if we change in some ways, and we insist on being a community, warts and all, the good, the bad, the ugly, huh, will survive. To have this sense of <coughs> canonia. Glory be to our God, both now and ever, and to the age of all ages. Amen.